In theory, we're live. Oh, I'm sorry. You always jump in volume when we go live. It's like the two of us talking nice and quiet and then, hi, we're live. Just, yes, every week, every week for, a, for I, however many years we've been doing this live. I want to bring the excitement. I want to show everybody that it's, that it's happening. And I'm incapable of remembering to turn my volume down. It's okay. Uh, so do you want to know a hack? For the people watching, how do you know that Fraser just recorded a new episode of The Guide to Space? Seems Your hair. Yeah. I I went back and I, I looked at the video from when we were doing the virtual star parties and the evolution in your hair is a thing to behold. <laughs> and yes, I, I approve your current hairstyle. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's all the wife. Um... Oh, hi, everybody. <laughs> I need to get my intro here. Um, okay. I'm, the sun is moving. It's so annoying that way. I'm quieter than you. I, I am running out of ways to make me louder. Uh, let me see. That's full output. That's full output. And not to make it suck. But... Um, Hello, everyone. I will say hello while Fraser fusses with with his boards and things and stuff. Wow, there's a lot of you today. What does this do? Please don't electrocute anything. There we go. I okay, hear more noise than I heard before. Yeah. Okay. We're back. Okay. Um, I can boost my audio a little bit. Let me see. So hello to Paul Gracie, Nasty Graziano, John Stifle, Nat Great 923, Quad Labet, Peter Quinn, oh, uh, Lars Ray Jepsen, scrolling, 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 Navi Ferry 64, Harry M. Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Are you not, are you not doing this from the participants? I'm, I'm doing ah. this. So, so, so on the live chat, over on the right hand the side, live. there's three little dots. Do you see that? Yes. Click that. And oh, it says participants. Crud. I'm making this so much harder. So you sure are. So click that. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to say hi to some of you multiple times. Do another. Hello. Go. Hello, Arnold Post, Ben Kalo, Bill Snugden, Capital. Capital H, Catalin Bonte, Chris Adams, David Joseph Wesley, Dusty Rishwein, Eric Bennett, Guido Bibra, Harry M, who I said hello to already, Henrik Bo Anderson, John Seifel, who I said so already, uh, Quad Labette, hello again, uh, Larry Beckham, hello again to Lars Ray Jepsen, and to Nate Great923 and Navi Ferrari64, hello, Noel Ruppenthal and hello again to Paul Gracie and then there's our Instra and names are coming in that I'm going to have missed. Rate Kisa, Rick Schwartz, Rudy Marquez, Sergio Batero, Shannon Melton, Sylvan Westby, Susie Murph, Tak Tang, Umu, Umu, <laughs> Yam Yamagashi San, I'm sorry, Zap Fan, Zap Fans, and I know that people yep. added and I'm sorry, capital H, I already got you. Barut Kankar, I didn't get you. I'm sorry to anyone I missed. Did I amuse you, Fraser? That was awesome. I loved it. I loved okay. it. It feels, feels like it, you just took the pressure off me, and uh, <laughs> and it was great. Okay. <laughs> Tech, Tech Tang says we should split the list and alternate. It's true. It's true. Uh, someone noticed the telescope. Look at that right there. And I will have one set yeah. up soon. So we're going to go into more details. There's sort of more unfolding, but, you know, a huge thank you to our friends at Oceanside Photo and Telescope for sending us telescopes. Yes, we've we've spent years saying these guys are awesome. Mm -hmm. And apparently they've been listening <laughs> yeah. and they want to help us better science all of you. Yeah. So 
awesome things are coming. Uh, if any of you tune in to Sunday's CosmoQuest Twitter, uh, not Twitter, Twitch feed, I, I will be attempting to assemble things on Sunday. Um, <laughs> And by by attempting, I mean, oh, good Lord, that tripod weighs a lot, which it should, but yeah. wow. Holy cow. Yeah, the, the package was 80 pounds. Yeah. So it's The really... tripod alone is 64 pounds. Yeah, it's, it's, I have trouble lifting it and carrying it around. It's a, it's a, it's a funny, funny thing. But, but boy, is it a stable mount for astrophotography. So, and that is the goal, is that we're going to learn astrophotography with sort of the modern equipment and hopefully bring you guys along with us as we do it and have... I'm going to go back to CCD imaging where I belong. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so if you're wondering what it is that you have stumbled into, this is going to be an episode of Astronomy Cast. We are going to record our episode, and then we're going to stick around and answer your questions about space and or astronomy. It's a thing. It's a thing. And I'm just realizing I totally forgot to tweet this, so I'm going to tweet it. Um, I am a bad person sometimes. We are live. Okay. I've now tweeted. I feel better. Okay. Good. So tell me when you're ready to press record. I I am pressing record. It is recording. Hello, Chad. I'm also recording. Hello, Chad. All right, here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 468, Simulations for Fun and Science. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, the Director of Technology and Citizen Science at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific and the Director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Doing great. Uh, so before we get any deeper into this episode, we just want to give a quick shout out to what is going to become sort of an unfolding story, and that is to our friends at Oceanside Photo and Telescope, who uh, just sent the two of us a brand new 70 millimeter uh, refracting, refractor. Uh, refracting telescopes with cool CCD sensors to do astrophotography. And we are going to sort of learn, upgrade our game in visual and astrophotography and bring you guys along with it. And a huge, huge thank you to our friends at Oceanside Photo and Telescope. Uh, podcast list, you can't see it, but Pamela just made a little heart sign. So uh, so big thanks to to OPT, who I think they're, they're like the biggest telescope uh, company or telescope retailer in the world i think so yeah they're a they're a great company they've and been sort of great to work with for years i think decades we've we've been you know talking and they're them. an utterly honest company mm -hmm. which is why i've recommended them so many times they have more than once prevented me from buying something more expensive than i needed to and been like no no no, no. you actually want this other thing that costs yeah. less yeah and that earns my coming back over yeah. and over and over forever yeah so they haven't have. sponsored the show they've just put a powerful telescope in our hands and uh you know we we want to give them a big thank you and of course it's going to turn into more work because now we're going to be like going and having to like learn how to do this and make videos about it and you know so you're learning i'm yeah. going back to yeah, my that's roots true. that's true i'm learning um all right, well, let's get on with uh, this week's show. So astronomers depend on simulations to study the universe from relatively straightforward orbital simulations to vast simulations that try to recreate the large scale structure of the universe from the Big Bang onwards. Today, we're going to talk about some of the simulations as well as tools you can use to simulate the universe for fun and science. Uh, all right, Pamela, so let's talk about some 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 universe simulations. How, you know, should we talk about the history first of sort of about this about this idea where, I mean, I guess, you know, you as a professional astronomer can make observations, but then you have to predict, you have to make, try to figure out if, you know, the theories match the observations that, that you've made. So how do simulations from from the perspective of an astronomer how do those two kind of come together well it it goes all the way back 
to the beginning. And initially, simulations were simply lots and lots of pieces of paper strung together. Organized by computers, in other words, human beings who... Right. Right. And, and so it goes back to the idea that folks like Chandrasekhar went through and figured out what are all of the equations that allow us to balance out the internal dynamics of a star. And once we have all of those equations, we have the ability to go through layer by layer by layer and simulate a star. And this is actually probably one of the first big simulations that almost every astronomy major is required to write where you're taking the equations, you're balancing the star, you're figuring out at what le le blah. you're figuring out at what level do you have radiation transfer, at what layer does convection kick in. And it kind of is miserable to do that by hand. And so we've been looking to find ways to simulate this in computers since before computers had anything more advanced than punch cards. And beyond just simulating stars, it's the how do we go through and figure out orbital perturbations to figure out what happens to comets over time, to figure out, given the fullness of time, how do the orbits of the planets change? Yes, you can go through and you can repeat the calculations over and over and over on paper. Kepler did this. But if you like yourself, then you figure out how to program a computer. Right, and let a computer do the uh, do the heavy lifting. Uh, the one made of silicon, not necessarily the uh, the human being. Um, Very true. Um, but but so, uh, and I think one of the things that's really important about this, right, is this idea that if you you want to make like if you have a theory and that theory makes predictions, but you have lots of historical observations that you've made through through the past, like like climate simulations, things like that, or well, climate, you know, you've got climate data, and then you develop a, a theory and a simulation, you've programmed a computer that does it, and then it runs the, the math and tries to mimic the past data, and then make predictions about the future, right? And, and it's not just going from past data to match current to match future. We do that with climate, but with galaxy simulations, half the fun is saying, hey, there's this crazy distorted uh, set of galaxies in the process of colliding. So look at the mice, look at the antenna. Let's see if we can, within the software, collide galaxies and figure out what the initial conditions were that led to these amazing splayed out splatterings of stars and, and gas. And how do we get the dark matter content correct and interacting correctly so that the collision starts as early as we see it starting on the sky? And it's from going through and trying to reproduce these in progress collisions that we're able to build up a complete understanding of how collisions occur. And and the most powerful computers in the world are used for this, like uh, simulating uh, supernova explosions. They use some of the most powerful, yeah, most powerful computers to just try and understand what's going on in there. And, and globular clusters is actually one of the places where all of that started. Uh, back in graduate school for me, so back in the early 2000s, uh, late 1990s, uh, they a group of scientists trying to understand all of the orbital dynamics inside of globular clusters had to develop the first ever petaflop supercomputer in, in order to get all of the different interactions going correctly. And uh, this has grown up into being the dragon globular cluster simulations being done at the Max Planck Institute. So these folks are still going along, still figuring out how to evolve a million gravitationally interacting stars and try and understand how is it that you have new binaries forming? How is it that you have these triple star interactions that fling a star outwards? And one of the coolest results is 
again, over the fullness of time, if you watch a globular cluster longer than humanity has existed, they actually pulsate like a heartbeat if the simulations have it correct. Right. And, and of course, we can't wait longer than human beings have existed. So, so having a flop computer, so a flop computer is the best, is the best that we can do. Yes. Um, but, and, and some of the, um, some of the ones that I find most fascinating, I'm, I've done a bit of writing about this. It's just these, these simulations of the entire universe where they start from like shortly after the cosmic microwave background radiation is released to the first stars to the first proto galaxies to the first galaxies to the cosmic web at the largest scale that we have today and the the level that the simulation can now predict what the universe looks like is just amazing and what's so cool about these is watching how they've changed over time trying to understand how you go from an essentially smooth distribution of matter in the dark ages of the universe to having the completely lumpy, bumpy Swiss cheese of modern day cosmology requires getting all sorts of different things interacting from figuring out how does different dark matter interact or not interact? How does the temperature, the, the velocity of the particles right after the cosmic microwave background is released affect things. You have to factor in all of these different effects and it's difficult. So we talk about how many particles there are. We talk about, uh, is it gas? Is it all these different ways of approximating things? And, and we've gone from basically a thousand by a thousand particle cube to million by a million to ever, ever larger simulations spanning more and uh, more fine grained periods of time. So it's no longer this seed represents what will become a galaxy to it's this seed represents a star cluster to this represents a star. And we can see the universe in our simulations turn on, light up, collapse down, and evolve into what we see. Yeah, um, the people listening to the podcast didn't see it, but I, but I was sort of putting up videos from this uh, illustrious uh, simulation showing what those simulations look like, and it's just it's so impressive just to see how well and how detailed and how accurate these these simulations are another simulation that i think is pretty great is people have simulated sort of what the future is going to look like you know let's take the future of the milky way and its interactions with the andromeda galaxy because they're going to be colliding in a few billion years and and here again it starts to be just how big is the dark matter halos between our two galaxies because it's those dark matter halos that will hit first and start triggering the interactions and then once the interactions are triggered how fast does dust and gas plunge into the center of our respective galaxies and turn on those black holes and we won't be here our planet will be a crispy critter but it's awesome to think about essentially what will this fireworks display look like absolutely uh now let's talk about some some stuff that that people can use on their own if they want to kind of get into this and be able to start playing around what are some what are some tools that they can use to actually run some simulations well, I, I think the one that people play with the most that in some ways is perhaps the most satisfying is Universe Sandbox. And it's available for Steam. It's in the Humble Store, a uh, Humble Bundle, uh, which is a way of buying things and also giving back, paying it forward through your purchase. And the Universe Sandbox allows you to play with gravity, to drop in new masses. It, it runs on all the major platforms, Windows, Mac, Linux. And it's just a nice, easygoing, kind of pretty simulation that lets you play with the universe. And who doesn't want to play with the universe? They are adding stuff to it all the time. Um, and sort of a recent alpha that I was playing around with, they had added tidal heating 
efforts yeah. and Roche limits and things like that. So you could like put, you could have the moon be going around the earth and you could move it closer and closer and closer until the tidal force, it crossed the Roche limit and it tore the moon apart into this ring. And then the chunks of this moon ring come raining down on on earth we've we've for some of our videos we've done things like taken the sun and turned it into smaller stars and had the stars orbit around each other uh, and they and they're adding new stuff all the time to to the game so like uh, so they're, they've added, you know, whenever something new is discovered like I'm sure I, have, I haven't checked but I'm sure they've added the interstellar asteroid Oumuamua into it uh, already. It's the kind of thing that they do. And so as soon as new objects, new planetary objects are figured out, new stars are figured out, new uh, galaxies are are discovered, they'll they'll drop them into the simulation spacecraft, and then you can you can do stuff. But there's a there's a great simulation you can do where you put two baseballs a couple of meters across apart from each other but with nothing else in the universe and you can just watch the gravity of them bring them together over the course of a couple of months and they and they bonk into each other because their gravity is pulling them together and and if you're more interested in just exploring our own reality without like tearing things apart which we all know is fabulous um if, if you'd rather stick to to the actual universe there's celestia stellarium and worldwide telescope all of which have different data layers you can turn on and off all of which allow you to essentially zoom around to different perspectives within the universe and get in and and really see what's out there but what I find really cool is a lot of the physics that goes into creating things like a uh, space engine, universe sandbox, all of these different, let's go in and mess with the solar system uh, simulations. The same physics we need to do for that is the same physics that goes into video games like Portal. And it turns out that they're hiring people who have degrees in physics in astrophysics to go work at Pixar and figure out how to get the hair correct in the animations yeah. to go work at uh, EA and figure out how to get it so that you actually fall through the portals just right and then tweak reality a little bit so you don't accidentally become a harmonic oscillator between two layers because your velocity balanced out too perfectly. Well, we talked about Universe Sandbox and they've got someone on staff who's who is a physicist, an astrophysicist by training, and her job is to pr provide the calculations and to make sure that that the the way that they're simulating this stuff, you know, matches reality to the to the best our pathetic computers can handle it. And and for a long time, one of the leads over at Pixar was Chris Ford, uh, who worked on their simulations for their animations. And he's another PhD physicist who took all of this knowledge and turned it into figuring out how to get clothing to move right, how to get hair to move right. And all of these problems are just different versions of the same physics that happens in outer space. It's just written at a different scale. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, we did a whole episode just about some of the space video games that, that we like to play. And, you know, we always talk about the Kerbal Space Program is this great simulation. It's got some flaws. It doesn't handle Lagrange points correctly. The the sort of the the amount, the e it's a lot easier to get into space from Kerbin than it is <laughs> in the real world, although people have made mods that make it more more matching reality. But, and I, you know, I say this every time we talk about this game, right? I have learned more about the way orbital mechanics works, the way space flight works from yeah. playing that game for just a few hours than, I, than all of the years of me trying, you know, reporting on, on space. Because it's one thing to like, oh yeah, and they had a Centaur upper stage and released the satellite into a geosynchronous transfer orbit et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. right that's that's one thing but to actually make your spacecraft get into a geosynchronous transfer orbit and realize that how you needed to build that second stage to be able to do it is just absolutely vital so it's amazing to see this they're they're coming back around that yeah, that the simulations make for fun games and learning to play these fun games are making people who are more prepared as scientists 
to be able to then go into the sciences and help push the science further. It's a really beautiful kind of connection. And what's cool is it starts to allow you to really answer questions like what would happen if a black hole slowly started to invade our solar system? And science fiction has often taken on these kinds of questions and have oversimplified them, have made it seem like everything would go to hell in a handbasket. But the reality is you can get a tiny black hole fairly far in before we start feeling its effects because the effects add up over time and it takes time to see, oh, oh, my planet is no longer where it should be. Uh, so I'd like to talk about a bit about where maybe simulations can can go a little, not awry, but they can cause controversy. And climate change is one of these examples where, where you know, a tremendous amount of resources are being put in to try and develop simulations for what the climate's going to be doing over time. And you've got, we've got all these past observations. And so then people are now creating simulations to try and predict where the climate is going to be going next. And yet the models that they're developing don't necessarily match. What and causes this uncertainty? <laughs> Well, so, so first of all, you have to make approximations if you ever want your software to finish running. And, and that is a fundamental problem. It, it used to be that when we were simulating stars, we essentially did a 1D simulation where we did a single cut from the core of a star out to its surface along a straight line and ignored everything going on outside of that line through the star. From there, we moved on to doing two-dimensional simulations where you start to see more of how the convection affects things. You start to get more effects from pockets of material. But the balloon you have in your 2D slice is going to be very different from the sphere of material you have moving in a 3D reality. And so as our simulations become more and more able to, to handle the real world as our processors get faster and our algorithms get better, but more because our processors get faster. Um, we're able to get a more realistic view on things, but it's, it's still not perfect. It's still not accurate because we don't know exactly how to model convection. This, this is like one of the most ridiculous things that the way oil burbles and moves in in your frying pan the way your the way your lava lamp works the detailed math of that we're still trying to figure out how to do that precisely and stars are a lot more complicated than lava lamps <laughs> yeah <laughs> so so we have to make all of these approximations and with our planet it gets even harder because cities, for instance, affect weather because they have a different heat capacity, a different way of storing heat in, in their asphalt and their cement. And how cities grow affects the weather as it passes over those cities. So you go back in time and you figure out what model matched what happened in the 50s. Okay, that's fine, except now everything has changed. And, and so we're dealing with this urban sprawl, cities changing, forest coverage, plant coverage, land capacity, amount of water in the land. All of these variables are hard. <laughs> yeah. I, I, and I think that we, I mean, we talked about this in a, in a previous episode about how actually short weather for, for short range weather forecasting has gotten surprisingly accurate. Like, like if the weather says that next week on Thursday, it's going to be raining, used it to will be, be that raining. Was, it was that was ridiculous. And now you kind of can rely on it. You know, don't plan your your vacation next week because it could be raining. And so that is I mean, that is the power of these supercomputers that have been simulating these weather in the short term and the medium term. And in the but in the long term, you've just got so many variables that can just take things into other into into other directions and so you just sort of put together all of the different simulations all of the same time and try to sort of find out what's the average that it's all telling you 
And and this is part of why we can't, for instance, uh, say exactly what the orbit of an asteroid is going to be over more than a few thousand or a few tens of thousands of years. The simple variations in soil color interaction with sunlight is going to change that asteroid's orbit in ways we're still figuring out and can't fully simulate. And so all of these things introduce uncertainty, they introduce error. And in our climate models, we're getting better, but we're not getting perfect. And it turns out that the world is, is falling to bits in a handbasket faster than we had anticipated in part because, well, um, we're affecting our environment faster than we anticipated. And then there's all sorts of different things we're just discovering, like heat sources under the Arctic ice shield that we didn't know about. And those are, you. It, sometimes you don't know your unknowns and right. that makes it hard. The classic Donald Rumsfeld uh, advice. Yes. Sage words. Um, so he says, ironically, um, but uh, the this prediction about the about the asteroid movements, I just want to go back and talk about that a bit again, because it's one of those situations where the universe feels for a certain extent, once you understand the math, the whole thing works like clockwork. If you get Newton's gravitational um, equations down, you should be able to predict the movements of all of these bodies for hundreds, thousands, millions of years. But but the reality is that even our most powerful computers can only simulate the movements of the planets within the solar system to a, to a certain point and then it all just kind of goes i don't know <laughs> and and there's so many silly little things that can be of huge impact so for instance the wrong coronal mass ejection hitting a near passing asteroid at just the right albedo ratio might create a minor deflection of the object that over a thousand years puts it in a completely different place or yorp 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 you know the the i don't even know all the parts of it but the 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 fact that asteroids as they rotate and they em they oh yeah emit yeah, yeah radiation it causes yes. a tiny thrust i'm sure someone listening to this sandy springman is probably going Yorp is, and I'll, I'll I'll look it up while you while you talk about Yorp, but the you know the implications <laughs> that it has on those simulations, right? So yes, and and this is one of those things where we don't necessarily know where on an asteroid surface it's going to suddenly decide, hey, I've got volatiles, I shall turn them into a jet. Yeah, and we also don't like I said, it's it's that fine grained interaction between different soil colors can make all the difference in the world. This is why painting asteroids allows us to move them. Not that we've done that yet, but we have in simulations. Yeah. And so, you know, as exactly in you know, we've done in simulations, I'm sure it's, you know, it'll be easy to do. But the point being that these asteroids are tumbling in in ways that are really hard to predict and the asteroids interact with each other and with other bodies in the solar system then in ways which are really hard to predict and the, your simulation runs out of steam beyond a certain point trying to look into the future so what are the limits of simulation what how far can we go and and what's sort of what can we not simulate well the inside of a black hole yeah. So if you want to know what we can't do, that's sure. one of those things we can't do. Um, we can simulate what happened prior to the release of the cosmic microwave background, but we can't yet test those simulations necessarily. Um, so there's lots of random holes where we kind of get stuck, but yeah, it's... <sighs> It's so hard to say what we can't do because someone's going to prove me wrong with an unpublished dissertation as soon as I say anything other than black hole. Other than black holes, but you feel pretty confident. I feel can... totally yeah. confident. Well, you know what's funny? Uh, this is time for a brief rabbit hole, which is that even gravitational waves can't show us what's going on inside the event horizon of a black hole. Yeah, it's totally true. Yeah, it is forever beyond our reach so it's and a, that's okay yarkovsky o'keefe 
Radzivsky paddock effect, YORP. It's named after the four researchers who, who developed parts of it. So that's what YORP means. Okay. Um, but uh, so let's give some, some people some recommendations and for some software to buy or some gifts to give people to get them simulating. So what would you, let's give some people some recommendations. What would you suggest they, they go out and buy? So, so as a starting point, Universe Sandbox yeah. and Kerbal Space. Just start with those two. Yeah. Um, if you want to start with free, another good one to explore existing spacecraft is NASA Eyes, so eyes.nasa.gov, and to explore the actual universe is Worldwide Telescope, um, and then Celestia or Stellaria. And there's another game called Space Engine which I know a lot of people want me to check it out, check out, which I haven't actually tried. Um, but I'm sure people are gonna be like, yeah, Space Engine is cool. The other thing is Stellarium, which is great to kind of uh, simulate sort of what the sky is going to look like in your area. And then you can drive that forward to be able to see what it's gonna look like in the future. And there's one more thing. If you go to, oh, Transit Finder, I think it's www dot transit dash finder dot com but anyway do search for transit finder and it will let you si it'll simulate when the international space station is going to pass in front of the moon or the sun within a certain range of your house and the exact date and time that you can do it so you can then go at that exact time go to that location look up and you will see the international space station fly right in front of the moon perfectly and it just seemed like a wizard which is which is awesome i've got one coming up on the fourth i think of december that's going to be about 30 kilometers from my house and so that is are you going to try and photograph I may, that i may try yeah i may try to go i don't know if i'm going to try and photograph it although you know video now, it and yeah, that would be easier now, or just go out and enjoy it so um cool well thanks pamela it's been my pleasure Stop and now we save I love, so I have to say, I've been seeing this discussion of what my fish are in, in the chat, which has been absolutely hilarious. And what are they? So so the big white uh, eely looking ones that keep zipping past, not that any are in the frame right now. Um, there, there's one up in the upper right hand corner. Um, those I, I full screen you there. Okay. <laughs> okay. So there's one Ely looking fellow swimming up along the surface of the water. He's now over on the left or she, I don't know which, um, I thought I was buying a pair of Cooley loaches that were somehow albino, which was deeply confusing, but I went with it and then they got much bigger than anticipated. And after doing some Googling, uh, I found out that uh, what I actually got was a gold, golden dojo loach or a weather loach. They're called both. Um, and they're happy little active fish. So I can't really complain other than they don't eat snails as I had hoped they would, or at least not with the same fervor I had hoped they would. And then I just have um, like your normal uh, white skirted tetras and neon tetras and some little quarry catfish. Um, it's just like my happy space. That's all. Right on. Got a bunch of great questions. Uh, Musk, Musky Elon wants to know if Universe Simulator likes more cores, threads, or megahertz. Uh, I don't know. Yes, all of all of the above. So, so I I think what it gets down to is does it run on the GPU or the CPU? Yeah, I don't know. It it can be very intensive running Universe Sandbox. I uh, I definitely find I'll 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 boot it up and sort of see if I can make it grind. Of course, then it'll wreck my upstream. Yeah, maybe right don't now, do that. But, well, it's okay. We've already done the show, so you know, what's, the, what's the worst that can what? happen? This is four sixty eight. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can put this here. And in fact, uh, someone asked me a question on on the guide to space recently and wanted to know what. Um, oh, there's some music happening. Somebody wanted to know what would happen if you put the moon on the Earth. And they would smush together into yeah. one larger object. Yeah. 
and that's a thing that you can actually uh, simulate with this. So. Yeah, it, it's that whole hydrostatic equilibrium thing. The oh. two worlds are too massive to like hold their structural integrity uh, yeah. due to self-gravity and they would just mush together. You you were already starting to stutter as I was running the program, but I've got a pretty fast computer. So uh, yeah, he's like, you sounded like you're drunk. It's pretty funny. I'm not. No, I'm I know. Totally so it's my time. computer thinks you're drunk. Um, all right. Can Arnister wants to know, can Dr. Pamela discuss the difference between the hyperbolic nature of Oumuamua versus the other hyperbolic comets? So Oumuamua is 1.2 versus 1.02 or less. And you had actually mentioned that, that, that when we were first saying like, oh, Oumuamua is the first hyperbolic comet extra solar. extra solar comet and you're like no, no no those have been seen it's not asteroid yeah. right so so hyperbolic just means it's on an orbit that it's gonna come in and go out and never come back and with the hyperbolic orbit the larger the number the closer it is to being a straight line so if you have something that's very close to one it's it's going to be almost a perfect parabola, except it's past that, which is what makes it a hyperbola. And and so it's just that little extra bit of hi, I'm leaving you for good. That that is the number over the over one that means it's it's gone. Now you get that number increased even more, it's becoming more of a straight line. So you can imagine um Oh, I discovered last night I can take BB-8 and remove his head and I have a sphere, um, which is strangely satisfying. Um, so if you have an object coming in, um, its orbit can either collide in, it can go around, or you can imagine, I can't do that with that particular object, if it comes in and it's basically flying past, but then the gravity bends it. Depending on how much gravity bends it, you will get a more and more bent orbit until it actually gets captured into an orbit. So the closer to a straight line it is, the higher the number. Um, the closer to one it is, that's where you're starting to get to a parabolic orbit. Uh, when you hit zero, that's when you have a circle. Right. Zero is a circle. Uh, I'm, uh, so I'm just going to show people here my browser. You're uploading your episode, aren't you? Oh, crud. I forgot to pause Dropbox. It's okay. It's all right. I will uh, I'll entertain people here. So so I just did a search on for the transit finder. And so these are the upcoming nearby transits. And they sort of give you the uh, rating. So I've got a one star here and I've got a... Oh, it's today. Uh, let's see where it is. Wow. So Friday at eight, sorry, at 1030, it's gonna pass right through the moon. Uh, just by the- No, it's going to pass right in front of in, the moon. It's, it's not pass, going through, it's, it's going not. It's going to do a nice <laughs> maximum transit right through the middle of the, uh, of the moon. And uh, yeah, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna go as, as their centers of mass collide violently, destroying the many billion dollars of effort we put into building yeah. the space station. Yeah, uh, which is cool. I, and and I mean the pictures that people are taking of of seeing it are just phenomenal. Uh, you can take pictures because you know where the ISS is gonna be. You know, point at the moon, get your telescope all lined up. And then you can take pictures as, and you see ISS coming towards the moon and then yeah. you're ready and then you just run your camera and you get a bunch of shots. So it's sort of, yeah. it's a handy target to aim your your uh, your camera at, which I, was, I think the advantage I'm looking for. So, um, okay, let's see, more questions. Uh, Gordon wants to know if we're in a giant simulation. I hope not. It doesn't matter. No, but yeah. I still hope not. Why? The, the idea that someone wrote code that led to 2017. <sighs> it's like, 
Uh, yeah, I, I guess. But right, but but it's you know people always say that kind of thing, and I'm like, maybe we're not the point of the simulation. Maybe we're just you know someone just simulated the universe, and the computer is so powerful. But the mice already figured out the answer is forty two. I know, right? By making the Earth, but still. Yes. So that's the point. You, we may not be the point of the simulation. So just because it happens to suck for us locally doesn't mean that it's necessarily, uh, you know, that that was intentional. It's just it's just an, a byproduct. Really, they're simulating what's happening to the, you know, the bug bladder beasts. Of The what what? The bug bladder beasts. That's also from the. Okay. The, I, uh, I think I must have like never read it correctly because I don't remember that. It's a. Man, I think there's like I need to reread those terrifying books. things that you can fight against in the anyway. In the, <laughs> I like Gore. So yeah, I love Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So so over in the Slack channel, Gordon was just like, maybe they just pulled from the wrong branch of their git. Yeah, exactly. That would explain so much. Uh, our intro says, but they never told us what the question was. Well, the question was. The, the purpose of the earth was to simulate the question, but I don't think we did learn the, the question. Uh, okay. There was an earlier question that was great. Well, okay, Larry Beckham wants to know, can you tack a painted asteroid sunward? So if you paint your asteroid, can you then cause it to come closer into the sun? And yes, right? Because it's the same thing with solar sails, that if you want to make yeah. your solar sail go to a higher orbit, you turn it one way and you make the additional thrust that it's getting from the sun increase its orbital But you'd momentum. need jets that would allow you to steer. So that's starting to be like, why don't you just fire the jets to get the thing pointed well, no, to the sun? No, no, but it's the same thing with the solar sail, right? You turn the solar sail one way and the light from the sun is raising its orbit and you right. turn the solar sail the other way and then the light from the sun is lowering its orbit it's so so i'm agreeing with all okay, of okay. that you're just saying it's but easier with... to do that so so with sailing the wind is is powerful and your sail doesn't weigh that much and when you're moving your sail back and forth to do the tacking it doesn't take a huge amount of effort it takes a huge amount of dodging but it doesn't take a huge amount of effort but if you're trying to tack an asteroid and rotate that whole asteroid side to side just use the jets you're using to do the tacking to just drive you straight into the sun it's far easier and he moves on to the next topic yeah sorry <laughs> um let's see Oh, Larry Beckham was noting that orreries, were they the first simulations? Yeah. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So if you don't know what an orrery is, you've probably seen one. You can make them out of Legos. They're cool. Yeah, it's 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 a simulated solar system. And it you know, you you've got all the different planets and they're on little arms and then they go around in different resonances to tr to simulate the movements of all of the all of the planets and you can you can buy them like if you want to give somebody who likes astronomy some old timey gift get them an orrery and and there's like one of the -R -R coolest ones o r r e y i think yeah. anyway orrery so one of the coolest ones is in the movie the dark crystal so if you want to watch a old school jim henson movie um that apparently was like telling part of the story of star wars that lucas decided not to tell um i go watch the dark that. crystal yeah hmm. now you know our intro wants to know how your break was i it was excellent i uh i went out to los angeles which is generally my most hated city on the planet uh, not literally, but it's on the list of ones I prefer not to go to. There are ones, ones I prefer not to go to even more. Um, but I was hanging out with friends where you couldn't hear the traffic and spend a lot of time at theme parks with friends that made the lines seem negligible. So I had a great time. And um, yeah, that's funny. I, I like it. Los Angeles. Because Los Angeles is like everything. Los Angeles is an entire planet of all of these little 
towns and each town has its own little personality and so although it is this vast sprawling megalopolis each little part of it has its own different little personality and so if you don't like where you are you can kind of move to another little spot in los angeles and and that part is is really cool and and the transportation system to get you from place to place like if it's you come, horrible if you come here all i can offer you is rainforest that's all I'm I got. I'm good with that. <laughs> well, sure. Until you're, <laughs> until you like really wish you had amusement parks, or although we do have sandy beaches or and mountains so, and, and but, snow, but still, the the reason I despise Los Angeles in general is it took us well over an hour to go 18 miles, oh. and I could have bike rode those miles faster. Yeah. Except I didn't take my bike as a carry on, and. You go to a city like New York or Washington, D.C. or Boston, and they have similar traffic, but you go underground and you escape it. Mm -hmm. And and Los Angeles has not mastered the whole underground thing. They will soon when Elon Musk's <sighs> boring company gets rolling. And and they have a few lines, but in general, public transportation in, in Los Angeles is not a thing that allows you to get easily from A to B at a rate that makes me not want to stab things. So I, I, I hate traffic. I hate traffic. And I want to be able to walk in public transit everywhere. And you cannot walk in public transit everywhere in yeah, Los Angeles. That's true. And I will stop now. Okay. You are definitely ranting. Um, but you come from Boston. Mm -hmm. So that is like one of the most walkable, livable cities out there. So yes, yeah, we yes, have the same is. situation in Vancouver, very walkable, very nice city for that kind of a thing. So you know, for people who grew up in that sort of place, people in San Francisco and everybody in Europe has these very accessible places for sure. But all I did when I was in Los Angeles, I just walked anyway. And so I walked enormous distances just for fun because I like to sort of see the cities go by me very slowly. And so I walk, also walked around Boston when I was there a couple of years oh, ago. Yeah. And I must have it's totally taken, walkable. Yeah, I probably walked 20 kilometers and just, just walked around the whole city just to see what I could see. Yeah, inevitably when I'm in Los Angeles, there's no way to get from A to B by foot without breaking laws. Right, yes. Yeah, it's true. They, they do uh, fight against it. Uh, Jordan Couch says he'd like to go mushroom hunting in my area. Yeah, you sure can go mushroom hunting here. Uh, I've got a secret chanterelles uh, spot that I can go and, and hunt mushrooms. Although, I hate to eat mushrooms. So, <laughs> I like to hunt them, but I don't like to eat them. Uh, More Carlo for the rest of us. The mushrooms, so I, I'm happy to. But, but my trick is berries. So, you know, the right time of the year, we can go out and I can find eight to ten different kinds of berries, edible berries in in the area. So That is you know, awesome. It's, it's, it's a party. It really is. Let's see. Any more questions? If not, we'll wrap up this episode. And, and here's a reminder. There will be... Uh, astronomy cast office hours for all of our patreon more than some amount i don't remember donors go to patreon.com slash astronomy cast and you can support the show and support us doing more of this thing that we love and um then yeah so come join us and hang out on sunday and Susie has sent out the announcements you've become the twitchosaurus I'm I'm working on it. Um, it's a fun technology because, well, with OBS, which is what we use for the YouTube Live, you can do so much better production than than we can do with straight hangouts. Yep. And I like the interaction that you can do through Twitch a lot better than the interaction that you can do through YouTube Live. So I I think that there's this neat confluence of plugins and add-ons yeah. for interaction in Twitch that we just don't have with the glory that is OBS, which we luckily do have. Yeah, I mean, I think people were noting, you know, now that we've got access to telescopes, maybe the virtual star party will make some reoccurrence. And I definitely think, you know, that'll be the place that it'll probably happen. There will probably yeah. be some version of 
the virtual star party on on Twitch. The the problem that I have, I mean, I have lots of ideas for all this stuff, and <clears throat> it used to be that I felt like we were oversaturating people's brains with the amount of content that was coming out. But now when I see game streamers put up, you know, they're there for eighteen hours, they're streaming nonstop, yes. people are watching. I don't think the amount of content is the is the problem anymore. And let me know what you think in the in the chat. I. Uh, but I always am always thinking about like, is this gonna suck? Will this be boring and dumb and nobody wants to do it and watch it? And so I try, I get stuck for sure, trying to think of things that would give people value. And yet I know there's lots of stuff that we could do that that people would enjoy. And you're having a lot of fun with Twitch yeah. and bringing stuff there. And you know, so I I think I need to just you know get over this little pity party that I have with uh, with myself and uh, and bring some interesting stuff. But you know, doing some like live telescope streaming would be a lot of fun, things like that, where you can literally just take people's requests and then. And yeah. and with, with OBS, we can do so much better than we've been doing before. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I am like a total fangirl of OBS. Same, same. Yeah, I'm never going back. And And what I'm finding really amusing about the Twitch population is like the other day I went on as, as Star Strider on my personal account and I was like, I was so excited, so very excited. I bought Civ 6 and it's just like I haven't played this game since it was like Civ 3 or 4 back in grad school and this is my favorite game. And I'm going to go on and I'm going to win with science and I'm going to explain all the science. And the game sucked. <laughs> it turns out Civ 6 is just like Satan's version of civilization. And like it's hard, I was, you mean? Or no, it's, it's just a stupid user interface oh, okay. and they managed to suck all the joy out of it. Mm, okay. And um, people were amused to watch me basically have a meltdown about how much I hated the game. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I've been playing uh, Dark Souls right now, and it's just, just creaming me, just, just absolutely murdering me, and I don't think anybody wants to watch me just fail and fail and fail. So, yeah, yeah, yes, I simply couldn't find I'm the absolutely joy. an OBS fangirl. Um, people want to know what your Twitch, what is your Twitch handle? So I personally am a uh, star strider with a Y just like on yeah. Twitter and then Cosmo quest X. Uh, I see Susie put it in the uh, YouTube chat. Um, we go on, there's two of us, me and Matt Richardson, who's our Cosmo quest postdoc who go on twice a week each and science it up. So like I went on Tuesday night and I showed how to do some coding and processing. So all sorts of different working math problems doing science i'm going to be assembling telescopes on sunday um so come hang out talk science sounds great all right well thanks everyone for watching this episode of astronomy cast thanks as always to the wsh crew for providing the chat and being the part and soul and producers of uh, of all of the stuff that we do we couldn't do this without you go to wshcrew.space to join the community and we just did a really cool giveaway with them with uh, this book, 100 Things to See in the Night Sky. And we'll probably do yes. more giveaways to that community. So check it out. All right. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye, everyone.